So, um, so yeah, that's me. My name is Kate Edwards. Some of you, many of you know me already, I guess, because I do serve on the board of IGDA Seattle. So yeah, it's kind of like a gratuitous talk this week or this month, because it's like, who are we going to get? And basically, that's what happened at a board meeting. One of the other board members said, Kate, you should speak. I want to hear you speak. And of course, he's not in the room. Um, <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate it. Anyway, um, so yeah, I basically, I'm a geographer. I'm also a consultant at NGLOBE, and yes, geographers do exist. Um, at GDC this year, I was at a networking meeting, and you know, I handed my card, which says geographer on it, and I handed it to one of the, I don't know what he was, marketer or something at, at GDC, and he kind of laughed, and he's like, oh, I didn't realize geographers still existed. So um, I'm like, yeah, we're, we are among you. And uh, we're actually this world's second oldest profession. So um, in any case, um, it's true. Look at Herodotus and all the historians and geographers. So anyway, what we're going to talk about tonight is essentially localization and culturalization. Now, culturalization is more of what I do for a living. And so I will weigh upon that more heavily when we get into the talk. And you'll see I like to speak through examples. The beginning part is mainly about localization. Um, which, you know, I, I do run the IGDA's game localization SIG, and um, we could go talk about LOC forever as well. But um, what I want to stress initially is that the game industry's future is global. I think a lot of people already realize this. I mean, it's not just because of the global ubiquity of content and, and downloading and everything else. It's the fact that the content itself is global. I mean, localization, a lot of people don't realize that it actually accounts for about 50% of the global industry's revenue. It's a lot of money. And if you follow what PricewaterhouseCoopers usually every year, usually earlier in the year, they, they issue a uh, forecast for the game industry and the entertainment industry. And they continue to show that for games, the global industry within about three years is going to be worth about $82 billion, which is, you know, since 2007 has doubled despite the economic downturn. That's staggering. It's pretty amazing. And, um, you know, when we see what's going on with all of the, the projects and the amazing successes, even like Rovio and stuff happening on Kickstarter, and a lot of us in the industry, we're not surprised, really. Um, so the interesting part is that per company, on a company basis, the local, localization revenue can usu it usually varies anywhere from about a third of the total revenue of the company to even as high as 70%, which is, which is gigantic, which usually means it's a company that's making like one game and then they localize it into like 20 languages, you know, and that's where they're making their money because they're being able to access other markets. And so what this really underscores is the idea that we really have to start designing games for a global audience. I mean, I know a lot of people in the industry today, a lot of what they focus on is primarily designing, I'm going to design a game that North America is going to enjoy. And then maybe I'll just localize it into Japanese or something else and see if anyone likes it over there. It's like, it doesn't work that way anymore. It's, it, it just doesn't. So... Um, and there's some other reasons for that, why it doesn't, um, from a culturalization sense, that we'll get to a little bit later. So, um, does everyone know what this means? No? No? So, in localization, this is very standard language. Um, these are the basic languages that you would expect every game to be localized into. French, Italian, German, Spanish, Japanese. So oftentimes, if you're like mingling with a localization crowd, which usually doesn't happen because we're hard to find and we don't like to mingle, but, um, well, it's a language barrier. Um, no, but basically, you'll hear people say figs and jay. You'll, they'll often use that phrase, figs and jay. It's like, so what's your game? What are you doing? I'm doing figs and jay. Maybe a little, you know, this and that and the other thing. And now, of course, there's a lot of different flavors to that. Of, you know, you've got French, you've got Canadian French, you've got, you know, European French, you've got, um, you know, Latin American Spanish versus Castilian Spanish used in Europe. Um, Japanese is Japanese. Um, so these are the most basic languages. These days, however, a lot, of, a lot of games that are coming out, I mean, a lot of them will do these languages first. Um, but it's changing rapidly because there's a lot of emerging markets out there. I mean, Eastern Europe is huge, um, and I'll get to some of those in a minute. But So currently, when you hear people, someone, people talk about game localization, this is usually what is happening today. So you can see here we've got kind of a basic model of production, very simplified. Um, and you can see that localization is primarily happening towards the end, and like everything is happening towards the end. 
And it's basically just a complete bottleneck. It's a complete uh, traffic jam. It's a huge mess for localization people, and you'll hear them bitch and moan about it, just like QA people do at the end of a project. So, um, but it's, it's very frustrating because localization is not just an end game thing. I mean, doing translation, considering how the text in the game is translated, how it's um, you know, transferred to other cultures, all the culturalization issues that we'll talk about, um, this just doesn't work anymore. And a lot of companies are beginning to realize this. Um, they really are. They're starting to focus on expanding this out because it, part of it is just the sheer volume of content that is out there. So this thing is being funky. Um, so, so typical localization time. So on a typical project, which actually is becoming more atypical these days, at least if you're talking about like a console game or if you're talking about like, especially if you're talking like a, you know, Skyrim or something like that, that's ridiculous in, in this size. But a typical game is somewhere around 30,000 words. And so you can see here, and I'm not gonna read through all of this, but you can basically see that um, the amount of time it takes to just go through this, this basic amount of content is pretty substantial. So when you look at the minimum time down there for how long it takes to localize a game, um, so if you're talking four languages, which these days is not that many, it really isn't. So you're talking 107 days times four languages, 428 days of localization time, which is, is you know, that's a lot. And that's, like I said, this is not even truly a typical game these days, but I mean, so this is in a best case scenario as well. This is assuming everything goes perfectly, all the content is completed on time, and we all know how often that happens. Um, you know, the writers don't have any last minute, you know, rewrites or whatever. Um, you know, all the artwork is pristine, it's, it just doesn't happen. So usually that factor can probably go up by 25 to 50 percent easily, that the amount of days that you would add to the localization time. So um, why does this keep doing this? So, okay. So, I'm sorry. There. Okay. So, we look at the typical game again. So, 30,000 words, 2,000 lines of voiceovers, so on and so forth. So, that's typically been uh, a typical game. I would actually say these days that's becoming more typical of some casual games or some like Facebook games, for example. Whereas you look at something like Fable 2, which by today's standards isn't even, it was big, but it's not nearly as big as a lot of games are today. So look at the, the word count, 48,000 audio files that have to be localized, you know, which is amazing. 54 different voices had to be done you know, locally by, by local voice actors. Um, and of course, if you add a male and female hero, so everything has to be done in both male and female tense in the language. Um, and so there's you know, 15 languages, fortunately one platform, and it really didn't matter. That really wasn't the, the biggest problem. So this is a staggering amount of content. I mean, stuff like Star Wars The Old Republic, which is one of the games I worked on, we're talking hundreds of thousands of words. I mean, like close to a million or more words in this game. So there's a reason that the game took so long to produce. Um, because especially on day of release, they released in what? Was it six languages? seven, including like Polish, I think, or something. I mean, it's amazing. It's an amazing effort. So the desired state of game localization looks more something like this. So people who work in localization, this is what we operate from. When we start a project, we're assuming it's going to go like this, but we're, but we're realizing it's going to go like the previous slide I showed you. And so every single project that comes up, we're constantly pushing people. No, start at the beginning. No, you know, the loc manager needs to be in that initial, you know, kickoff meeting with everyone else, which is happening more often these days. But there was a time not that long ago where the loc people weren't informed until like the, everything was basically set in stone. The train was rolling out of the station. And they're like, oh, by the way, you know, come September, we're going to have about, I don't know, 600,000 words for you to do. And so you may want to start like getting your people together and um, the other problem is a lot of the tools that are provided for localization just aren't there. I mean, for example, one of the best things you can give a translator is a what you see is what you get kind of tool. So if they were able to actually go into the game and translate in the game, both dialogue, signs they might see on the wall, all that kind of stuff, it would just be 
so much easier because language, of course, is often about context. It's so important to know the exact context of what you're translating. And so that often doesn't happen because today, even today, even though this is a practice that goes back at least 20 years, most localization people, the translators, they get an Excel spreadsheet that has lines from the script. And they basically have a column of the lines, and then there's like, put in your language here. So just translate this to this and give it back to us, and you're done. With no context, they don't know who's speaking. You know, they don't know anything about the character. Um, so it's just, you know, it's kind of crazy. So those of us in the localization SIG, this is the kind of thing we're pushing for. We keep hammering on the industry. You really need to change this model. And like I said, a lot of companies are getting it just because of the sheer content volume. So in a way, I'm thankful that there is a very high content volume because that is kind of forcing companies to realize, well, unless we want to release this game three years from now when it's going to be ready later this year, we really have to get Loke involved very early on. Because actually, localization can really help with making some of those content decisions in the creative process you know, well, you know, if you guys use this word instead of that word, it's going to make localization easier down the road, or it's going to make us more efficient. Or if you make that character, you know, this tense or whatever, I mean, they can give that kind of advice to make this content ready for global release. So um, some of the top localization strategies I'm going to pass along. So I already mentioned this one. You have to treat localization as an as a equally important team role. Um, it's still not happening often, but you know, you could use the I, we don't get no respect kind of thing, but you know, everyone in the game industry says that about their job. So um, the other thing that's super important that a lot of people are not doing is write world-ready codes. The developers are not coding their games so that it's ready to use Unicode, it's ready to be adaptable and to incorporate different language technologies and all these other things. And this is a really simple thing. I mean, this is kind of a basic you know, best practice of writing software today, regardless if it's a game or not. So, um, so this, is, this is a really important one, too. Another one is that I see a lot of game developers uh, not do well is, is manage their content. So, for example, I, I did work at Microsoft for 13 years, and I worked a lot on the games there. I basically worked on pretty much everything they did between 95 and 05 when I left on the first party side, and so, and also the PC, uh, PC and Xbox stuff. And so, one of the things that sometimes was a problem, but it's not just Microsoft, I'm not picking on them, but it's just, I've seen a lot of companies do it, is that they just don't manage their assets well. They don't know where they are. It's just like, if I see, for example, because like in my job, which we'll kind of get into in a minute, when I go look at like a, a, an environment that someone created for a game, and there's a sign up there, like in Chinese, okay? And what do I ask them? I said, what does that sign say? They're like, well, it's just Chinese characters. I'm like, what does it say? Does it say, is it like, you know, is it an offensive word in Chinese? I mean, I need to know this. And they're like, well, I don't know. I think they just, the artist just, they either found it or they just put it in there. I don't know. And, and so it's like, well, can you find the asset because we might need to change it? And then that's a case where like, well, we're not exactly sure where it is. It's like, well, what do you mean? It's like, well, it could be that file. It could be this one. We're not quite sure where the build is pulling it from and just all this. It's just like... <laughs> You know, it's frustrating. And I mean, believe it or not, that's happened. It's happened more than once. So, um, so it's just really important. And not only that, but just tagging as well, making sure that content is tagged appropriately or however they manage it, it just needs to be done well. And of course, you always, always must assume global, global exposure. That goes back to my point earlier that all this idea of like, well, we're going to design a game for North America. It's like, it doesn't happen that way anymore. You're designing a game for global consumption, period. You know, now whether or not it's consumable on a global scale is a whole other issue that we'll talk more about, but because there is a linguistic barrier and there is a cultural barrier as well. But um, you have to assume that it's going to be out there because that's what happens today. I mean, I, I still hear people say, well, we're going to release in the United States and Canada and the UK and France and Germany, and that's all we're going to do. It's like, well, fine, that's, that's where you intend to release. So there's the intent to release, and there's also the reality of release, where it's also going to be in Beijing and Hong Kong tomorrow morning on the streets for sale for a buck. And you know this, right? And they're like, well, no, why would they do that? And it's like, okay. Um, anyway, so that's, that's a very important point, and we'll really touch on that more. You'll see why that's more important. 
So if you want to increase your revenue in a game, here's a very simple way to do it. And of course, everyone says, yes, we do, right? We want to increase our revenue. Um, the first thing is localize into at least one language. It's very low-hanging fruit these days. Now, a lot of people, I know indie developers even, who have gotten interested in doing localization, and they're like, well, we don't have money to do like a really high-quality loc. It's like, well, you know, there's a lot of translators out there who are really kind of starving. They're like grad students, and they wouldn't mind, you know, charging very little. Or some people out there will actually do it just to have credit in the game because it builds their portfolio. And so you can find these people out there. I mean, that's one of the things we do in the Loc SIG. There's translators in the Loc SIG. You know, and we actually did a, we, we do a crowdsourcing project through the IGDA. Now, we don't do it for private games. We do it for the IGDA and, like, the Global Game Jam. But the, the idea is there. And, and there actually are a lot of companies out there that are getting into crowdsourcing their localization. And it's in, it's in a lot of cases, it's becoming quite successful as well. So localizing into at least one language can almost instantly increase revenue potential. But it's certainly, if not revenue right away, it will increase exposure immediately. Um, so for example, in the US, it's obvious you also do a localization for Spanish. You know, that's a kind of a no-brainer in the United States. But it not only opens your game to, the, to a whole other population in the United States, it opens your game to the entire Western Hemisphere just like that. Now, yes, it might be Castilian Spanish, not Latin American Spanish, and there's all kinds of vocabulary differences between, you know, Colombia and Venezuela and Nicaragua and everywhere else, but, but the point is it's still legible, so it, this instantly makes your game accessible. So that's one of the easiest things you could do. Just take a game, localize it into Spanish, and you open up your market right away. Um, some companies out there have increased their, their annual revenue in one, just one year by 25% just by doing something like that. You know, all they had to do was spend some money on localization and, all, and they put the game out there and they're like, my God, people are downloading the Spanish version. Why? And it's like, because they speak Spanish. So, you know, or they prefer Spanish over English or whatever. Um, there's even some examples, these are larger publishers, EA is one example, where they've actually learned to go back into their library and look at games that came out in North America and Europe maybe three or four years ago, and they're like, you know, this game was kind of cool and it got decent reviews, but maybe if we spent some money on, say, Russian, we'll localize into Russian because Russia, Eastern Europe is a burgeoning market right now. Um, like I said, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, the Middle East is huge. It's a huge market right now. People don't realize that. Um, but a lot of the Middle Eastern content is being developed internally for the cultural reasons that we're going to get to in a minute. So, but, but some publishers have seen a 500% return on investment. So they spent some money on Russian localization, they put the game out there, and they basically made 500%. Of that, of that cost. And so they were just kind of like, hmm, that's not a bad idea. So they have basically started to go back and try and mine their catalog and see what else can we pull out of the dustbin and try and resurrect in a different country. Um, so it's kind of a fascinating dynamic that's going on out there. Um, so that's basic, basically what I, the main stuff I want to say about localization. Of course, we could always talk more about it in QA, but um, what I'm really going to get to is the other part that people often hear less about, which is the culturalization part. So, so adapting games you know, through localization, basically through translation, it's always going to be important. Like I just demonstrated, revenue streams depend on it. All you have to do is translate, and you instantly open up markets. You instantly open up uh, different uh, demographics. Um, what's becoming even more important is des actual designing the game, not just making it and translating it, but actually designing it with the intent of not only making it global, but also targeting different regions or cultures to make sure that the game will be appealing to that market um, and to try and tap new kinds of consumers. So, so I'm going to run through kind of my framework for, for definitions to kind of give you an idea of where I'm coming from. So... So content, obviously, this is information, basically anything the player's going to see, hear, or read. Um, it's pretty straightforward. We all know what content is, right? Um, context is essentially the time-space environment in which that content is created. Um, and that, too, pretty straightforward, you know? Um, 
Culture, however, that's a loaded word. I mean, I can go into all the anthropological definitions and the heaviness of that, of that concept, but what, the way I see it, I've been doing this kind of work for about 20 years now, and what, what I've kind of seen, especially in the game industry, is we're really thinking of culture as content assets, and that's the right way to think about it, in my view. And so we, rather than think about everything that culture entails out there, think about the mapping excuse me, of content assets from one culture to another. So for example, just to clarify, so my, my ancestral background is primarily Scottish. So I said Scottish, Scotland, what's going through your head? Beer, <laughs> kilts, bagpipes, haggis, you know, what? Right, sausages, Loch Ness Monster, I mean, all this stuff, you know, now people are saying, oh, this stuff is very stereotyped. It's like, well, yeah, it is. It is. I mean, that's a whole other issue as well. But, but it's also, these are things that kind of define in the global viewpoint what Scotland is, you know, whether that's to the benefit or not of the Scottish. Um, you know, but a lot of Scottish people are kind of proud of it, and others are just like, ugh, you know, tourists. But... Um, the point is, these are content assets. The look of it, you know, the, the, the tartan pattern, the sound of the bagpipes, the taste of the haggis, you know, or tripe. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. These are each things, these are basically assets that define that culture. In the same way, every single game has assets that define the world, that, the world of the game. They've audio, they've got text, that describe it, they've got visuals that, that show it. And so there is a way to sort of map the cultures that we interact with as we're distributing games with the cultures we're creating in the games you know, that, uh, that we're working on. And so content basically carries culture with it. I mean, every game's content um, carries with it assumptions, assertions, I mean, because we, you know, for those of us who were born and raised in the United States, we have a certain set of assumptions in the way we look at the world that's different from someone in, from France or someone from Tahiti or wherever. Um, and that just comes along with it. You can't escape that. You can, you know, sort of overcome it, but it just happens. And so content creators kind of carry that with them. Um, and it just, it's just something that comes out. At the same time, every game's culture um, is going to be tested by the expectations of the local market. So when you get your game out there, all of those assumptions that are in the game will be tested. So if you want to look at it this way, so we have our, the game worlds, everything that we're creating, the aggregation of all these spaces and whatever they are, Facebook games and mobile games and everything else. Um, and then you've got the worldviews of the gamers. So you've got basically all of their assumptions, all their expectations on what they consider to be rightness, wrongness, appropriateness, you know, coolness, you know, suckness, whatever you want to say. Um, they've got their own view of it. And yes, it's different from culture to culture. So when you put these two together, that's where you have the zone that, that where I work in, where you have a zone of either compatibility or incompatibility between the content assets. And so this is where the challenge really lies. This is where culturalization comes into play. It's when the gamer is actually interacting with the game content, and we have to decide, you know, are we going to try and meet their expectations at a deeper level than just language? you know, or just gameplay, which obviously is still very important because most gamers out there, they only, they're only going to give you two pieces of feedback. It rocks or it sucks, and that's it, you know, and, uh, and there's all kinds of flavors around that. So, um, so this is the zone that we have to think about, is, is making it compatible or whether or not it's incompatible. So here's uh, a graphic example, and I do like to speak through examples, so from here on out in the talk, we'll get kind of more into some examples and visuals. Um, so localization, here's a, here's a fundamental difference. So you've got a strawberry Kit Kat bar. The top one is the Canadian version in English and French, and the bottom one is in Japanese. These are, are essentially the same product, more or less, strawberry Kit Kat. So the only difference here is the packaging, really. You know, there's two different languages. The, uh, when you take a look at culturalization, here's what Japan has done to the Kit Kat bar. They have basically taken this and made it a complete cultural phenomenon that does not exist anywhere else in the world. 
Um, you certainly don't see this in the United States because I think we have, what, one or two boring flavors? In Japan, they've got flavors that have been regionalized all around the country. And you can see, for example, in Hokkaido in the Northern Island that yubari melon and baked corn are flavors that are very popular to people in Hokkaido. And so they have made Kit Kats that appeal to that particular you know, taste buds or, or flavor. Now, I know you kind of like sweet potato Kit Kat, <sighs> you know, but I mean, I've tried some of these, they're not bad. <laughs> I mean, so um, they start to kind of all taste the same, but, um, but yeah, it's actually become such a phenomenon that you can see here how you basically have to go to different regions of Japan in order to collect the different Kit Kats. And I actually know a couple of my Japanese friends who've done exactly this. They kind of considered a sort of cool, re cool thing to do when you're traveling your own country. Um, so you know, this is this is an idea. This is something that has been wholly culturalized. This Kit Kat has become a Japanese phenomenon um, that is different from anything else that we know. Um, so there's really, there's two types of culturalization that we deal with typically. Reactive culturalization, which is essentially trying to find those things that are going to make governments pissed off. They're going to make consumers and players pissed off. Um, it reduces the viability of the game in the market. Basically, that's it. It's something that someone's going to see. They're going to say, this game needs to be banned because of this or this. Um, for better or worse, this is kind of most of what I do because that's what clients want. They're more afraid of that than the other part, which is proactive culturalization, which is actually looking for things that is going to enhance the experience, make the game feel more local, make the game feel more relevant to the, to the player. Um, and so more companies are starting to think about that as they're able to, part of this goes back to the whole localization discussion about making sure your code is designed so that you can do that kind of thing. So for example, you can swap out elements easily that's gonna make it possible. So for example, when I worked on Forza Motorsports, one of the things we did was to make sure that in Europe, the car set that was available is different from the United States because Europeans don't wanna play Mustangs and Corvettes and stuff like that, whereas Americans love their muscle cars. You know, but you know, a lot of the Europeans wanted Maseratis and Lamborghinis, which Americans do too. But, um, but you know, I mean, they just there's different flavors there, and so to add different vehicles that are more appealing to different markets is is one of those things that's that would be considered proactive culturalization. So here's a couple examples. So here's a very typical reactive culturalization issue. You probably recognize this from Fallout Three. Um, came out a few years ago. This is the Brahmin, the two-headed Brahmin bull that's a mutated animal in the post-apocalyptic Washington, D.C. landscape. And um, what's wrong with this? Well, essentially, because it's a Brahmin bull, the Brahmin is sacred to the Hindu religion. In India, they actually maintain laws that protect Brahmin bulls from being harmed, at least real ones. Um, you can surmise whether or not that would transfer to virtual ones. You'd have to ask a lawyer. But... Um, but the, the fact is that the sensitivity is there. It's that sensitive that they've actually created laws to that effect. And so the fact that this, this animal, this two-headed Brahmin bull that was mutated, you could eat it, it was radioactive, you could use it as a pack animal, and so on and so forth, this basically prevented the game from being released in India. This is it. This is the only thing in the game that was a problem for India. And the problem is going back again to the previous discussion, like the code issue, like we went back to Bethesda and said, is there any way you can swap this out? You know, just swap it out. Put in, like, for example, a two-headed horse, you know, or it could be a two-headed giraffe. It could be anything other than a Brahmin bull. And they're just like, no, we can't do it. Especially because at that point in the game, the game was done. The game was finished. And so the company's going to ask themselves, is it really worth going back all of that expense to throw in a different animal? Is it really going to gain us that much for the Indian market? And their, their answer, was, which is probably at the time a wise business decision, was no, it's just not worth it to us. But at the same time, you have to think about the long-term possible gain because there were a lot of Indian gamers. I went and read a lot of the blogs out there who were extremely disappointed they did not get to play this game. You know, and now India is not a huge market, but it is growing fast, and there are a lot of people there, a lot of people. Um, so it's a huge potential market. And so this is one of those cases where they could have got in as one of the earlier large games that, that committed to going to India, but um, unfortunately it didn't happen for that reason. Here's a proactive culturalization. So some of you have probably seen this, but uh, Marvel 
partnered with an Indian studio to produce an Indian version of Spider-Man. And um, you can see here that basically from the waist up, he's pretty much Spider-Man. Um, the rest of him has more of a traditional costume. And obviously the setting is very different than what, uh, you know, it's not New York. But um, this was very appealing. This, this was a very popular thing that, that they did. And so this is a great way we we're basically taking a known IP. And again, they just kind of added some extra work. And more, very importantly, they did partner with a local studio to kind of make sure that what they were going to do was going to be acceptable and, and viable for that market. And so this was kind of a fun thing that they did. Um, so in a broader sense, there's three degrees of culturalization as I see it. And um, so we have level one, which is reactive, which we talked about. There's level two, which is localization, as we all know it, and, and internationalization of the code and, and all that kind of stuff. And then level three is the proactive culturalization. So if you want to look at it a different way, is basically like this. Make it viable. Most important thing, you've got to make sure the game can stay in the market. Localization doesn't do that. You can localize a game, but you still might have a content element that's going to be a problem for whoever, the government or, or gamers or someone. So you want the game to be able to stay in the market because there are a lot of games that don't get translated, but they still become popular in different markets because the players there either can work their way through the English or you know, they find other ways to, to play it. Making it legible, of course, is important. That's the translation piece. And then going the next step of making it actually meaningful. So it's not just something that'll stay there. It's not just something they can read and understand. It's something that they feel speaks to them. It's a game made for them and their culture. So we're going to talk about the five major cultural factors that often affect games. Get a little sip. Um, so we've got um, history and uh, the sacred versus secular issue, um, inclusion versus ex exclusion, which often is referring to ethnic and racial issues, um, intercultural dissonance, which is kind of a broad category for all the other stuff that happens where different countries or cultures don't like each other, and uh, geopolitical imaginations, so basically governments who like to reinforce their sovereignty and their view of their territory on other people. So the long and short tale of history. So historical memory in any given market or country is very persistent. Now in the United States, we can't relate to this that much because we have been around like hardly ever compared to most countries and cultures out there. Um, so here's a great example from Age of Empires. So here we have, during the Middle Ages, the, what really happened, history really tells us what this happened. So the Yamatos in blue on Japan invaded the Korean Peninsula, and in red is the Chozon Empire. And so the Chozon Empire was effectively overrun by the Yamatos. And it's one of many you know, exchanges and incursions that would happen in this region over the centuries. But basically, this is what happened. And so when Age of Empires was released in Korea, the Ministry of Information said, um, excuse us, but it didn't really happen that way at all. I mean, the Yamatos never stepped foot on the Korean Peninsula. We're like, really? That's what well, all these stack of books say that. But um, so basically, we had to, this is where you had to make a choice. What do you do here? I mean, do you just forget about Korea? I mean, we all kind of know at this point how big an RTS country that is for RTS games. I mean, of course, this is pre-StarCraft, but, but still, I mean, you know, so basically what we ended up having to do is make a patch that changed history. So in this scenario, you can see it's quite different. So the Chozon were effectively on Japanese territory and the Yamatos were repelling them rather than the complete reverse. And so you can imagine that this caused a huge ethical discussion. Is this the kind of thing we should be doing? You know, I mean, should we be changing history for the sake of this game? And then, other, you know, then it just get into a very large argument. It's like, well, but it's a game. It's kind of, we're kind of making a fictitious scenario of history anyway. And so um, I'm not going to get into that whole argument, but effectively you can understand that um, internally among the team, this became a very, you know, much talked about issue. 
Um, there's also recent history. So I'm sure a lot of you heard about this game that was about to be published by Konami, but Konami at the last minute basically bailed and said, we're not going to do it because there was so much controversy about this game. Um, because if you don't know anything about the back backdrop, it's basically a game that was developed around the real story of a few soldiers who were, who were in this battle, um, which was, what, 2004, the Battle of Fallujah during the Iraq War, which was a very bloody battle. It was very controversial and all these, you know, it has, it has kind of a tainted history to it. But the game developers felt that they wanted to tell the story of these soldiers. But the problem is that a lot of military bases, they said, we're not going to support this. We're not going to stalk this. In fact, we're actually going to fight this. You know, we really don't want to see this. And of course, the media outlets picked it up and they're like, this is very un-American and blah, blah, blah. You know, and so... You know, and because you know these images are very fresh in people's minds. I mean, this is this is recent history. This is very recent, and so you have to ask yourself, what could they have done here? You know, now if they had asked me, I would have said you could have made it six days in make up a fake Arabic-sounding name, and just don't make it Fallujah. I mean, the fact that it's Fallujah, but of course that then dilutes the whole story of the soldiers who were there. But you can still tell their story. By making it, by kind of making an allegory of a different place, but they, but they, you know, the game developers wanted to remain true to the story. So, um, to this day, they're still looking for a publisher. So it's at this point, I'm sure, you know, maybe in five or ten years, when we we're kind of distanced from that whole event, I would imagine this would be no problem to release. Um, so, oh, I. They, or they could self-publish, exactly. That's always a possibility, too. So then we have um, dealing with the sacred versus secular issues. So basically, when you're releasing a game into a market that has a basis for expectations that is on, based on religious beliefs versus you know non-religious beliefs, and so this can become very touchy, as you might imagine. Um, so some of you may have heard about this issue with Resistance Fall of Man, where the Church of England found out that the Manchester Cathedral in the UK was replicated and used, not just replicated, but used as a battlefield within the game. Now, I have to applaud Sony, because they did a great job of replicating the cathedral. I mean, it's beautiful, but at the same time, they kind of ruin it. So, um, and the Church of England was really upset about this. They, they basically contacted Sony. They're just like, cease and desist. Well, the game was already out. I mean, it's already out there. They're like, you need to change this. We can't. And so basically, they just came, they came to an agreement eventually. But this kind of prompted the Church of England to issue what they call sacred digital guidelines. And so it's a short set of guidelines in which they basically say different rules, like, hey, if you're going to use one of our buildings, ask us first. You know, don't assume that there's no copyright on these buildings, which is a very good point, because a lot of very famous buildings out there, especially in France, ha have a copyright to them of some degree or another. Um, like at one point, the French government was basically saying, if you do any aerial photos, like for mapping, they said basically the, the ground of France is copywritten. So you can't like go in a plane and take a picture downward and sell it because that belongs to us. This is French soil. Um, anyway, so... Um, Another example in Hitman 2, so at the Golden Temple in Amritsar, India, which is the, the, basically the center of the Sikh religion, you had the, I don't know, if, was he a protagonist or antagonist, whatever he was, the Hitman. Um, you know, he, they actually went into the Sikh temple, and you can see he's fighting against Sikhs, which that's what you would expect to see in a Sikh temple. But this was also very sensitive, too, um, just because of the setting, um, you know, and it's just... Uh, yeah, so that one was kind of like the, the Manchester one. And then, of course, we have these ones, which uh, especially Kakoto Chojin on the left there, which was sort of the poster child of, um, of bad mistakes. So basically what happened is both of these games had audio files that had lyrics from the Quran in them. Now, the one on the left, Kakoto Chojin, um, this was a hand-to-hand -hand fighting game. It was kind of you know, well, it says it's brutal or it's not on there. I think it's called Back Alley Brutal or something like that. Um, the main feature of the game is as you beat each other up, you bruise and bloody and it gets really graphic. But anyway, the point is that there was a file that was chanting from the Quran 
in, in that game. And so it was identified very late in the process. The game got released only to North America because they felt, well, you know, it's, it's safe here, right? There's no Muslims in North America, you know. So anyway, so basically, just like clockwork, about three or four months after the game released, the Saudi Arabian, Saudi Arabian government protested this. And um, it became a huge media issue in the Middle East. Um, I was actually part of this at the time. I ended up having to go to Riyadh and Dubai and other places to help do damage control because they want to kind of parade me and say, look, we've got a geographer and they, they're supposed to know what they're doing. It's like, I did. I told you so. I said, don't do it. But you did it anyway. I didn't say that to the people over in the Middle East, though. Um, but anyway, it was a huge issue to the point where that one audio file, a brief audio file, actually caused this game to be recalled globally and was buried. So about two years of work, however much money went into this, gone completely. And so um, that was very unfortunate. What was very interesting is I gave a talk about that at GDC 2006. That was one of my examples. Sitting in the audience was someone from Sony. And so that person from Sony, who happened to be in the group that also kind of looks over these kinds of issues. Um, when Little Big Planet came out, they found an audio file that had lyrics from the Quran in it. And um, what happened there is that Sony decided to delay the release of Little Big Planet in order to fix the problem. Great move, smart. But then they made a public announcement telling people why they were uh, delaying the game. They told them very specifically why they were doing it. Oh, well, we found this audio file that has Quran lyrics and blah, blah, blah. And people, as you would imagine, still got very upset because the, lo the reaction from people who are Islamic or you know, in different countries, they're like, how can you be that stupid? How could you even not know what the lyrics were? How could you, I mean, it's just unfathomable to these people, which is very reasonable, I think, from, from their viewpoint. There, you know, why, how could you not know that, you know? But it's like, a lot of times, they did, well, they just don't realize in the game development world, you're just like churning stuff out. Give me an auto file to plug in there, good, okay, put it in the build, let's go, get it out the door. Um, so anyway, so, so unfortunately, even though Sony had very good intentions for that, um, it kind of backfired a little bit. But of course, the game was still released and it became very popular and remains very popular. Um, so Little Big Planet kind of survived um, whereas the other one definitely did not. Um, and of course, this kind of has relationships to what happened in Denmark in 2005 with the Danish cartoons of Muhammad and everything that resulted from that. And um, so this can become very serious. I mean, obviously, this could be a, a very serious issue depending on the severity of the offense and who actually sees it at the time. And there's also a, a geopolitical context to it as well, which I'll bring up in another example. So which is coming up right now. So inclusion versus exclusion, or it's the next one. So it's when people perceive that they are being treated inequitably for whatever reason, you know, usually on the basis of their particular national culture or their ethnicity or some other reason. And so here's an example, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard. Um, when Resident Evil 5 came out, prior to the game coming out, they released a lot of these images that show the protagonist going around a sub-Saharan African village shooting the villagers. Now, of course, the company is like, yeah, but they're zombies, so what's the big deal? And it's like, do you not realize some of the historical imagery associated with this? The notion of the great white hunter, the notion of the dark continent, and all these other ideas that you know, were very popular in the 19th century and even into the 20th century, these are very powerful images for certain ethnic groups and people who are sensitive to this. And so showing this you know, guy walking around in a village shooting him, it doesn't matter if they're zombies because the people who are don't, not playing the game, and I'll interject this right here because I think I didn't put this slide in, is that we need to make this very important distinction between the intended and the unintended audience. So the intended audience is essentially the gamers. They're the ones, like I said before, does it rock or does it suck? That's all they really care about. You know, they're really not as much looking at these kinds of issues, although they will, they will voice them if it really touches them deeply. But for the most part, they, they care about the gameplay. Is it fun? Is it, is it engaging? Is it boring? Um, 
It's the unintended audience are the ones who are looking for this kind of stuff. Now, people might say, well, screw them. I'm not making the game for the unintended audience. It's like, really? It's like, well, you know that unintended audience are the ones who often create legislation that tries to regulate you. They're the ones who don't understand what you're doing. They're the ones who don't play your games. They're the parents, although becoming less so because of the generational changes. Um, they're the legislators, they're clergy, they're other people who just don't understand, they don't want to understand, and that's a very important thing to keep in mind. I mean, that audience is extremely important because those are the ones, when I say reactive culturalization, the reactive part is mainly coming from the unintended audience. It's not coming from the intended. And so it's very important to keep in mind. And so I've had debates with some developers who say, I really don't care about that unintended audience. It's like, well, then that's... You know, to quote Yoda, that is why you fail. So um, that's why it's still going to be a problem, because you do need to account, because whether you like it or not, those, those unintended people are still part of the global community. They're still there. And if you don't want to keep seeing these stupid laws created to regulate your content, then you need to do something. That doesn't mean you appease them necessarily, but it means you at least think about them when you're designing your content. And I'll get to uh, a little, another point on that a little later. Um, uh, I did it again. So, okay, here's another one, Pocket God, uh, if you have it on your iPhone or smartphone. So this one, you know, where you, uh, if you haven't played it, where basically it is what it says, that you are the god of this little island, and you can do all kinds of fun little things to these guys, like, you know, you can burn them with the magnifying glass, you can make the ants come out and eat them, you can make the volcano erupt so that it basically, you know, spews fire all over them. And so the developer was like, um, you know, a lot of Polynesian groups were not happy with this, you know, which I would say for obvious reasons. And, and the game developer's response was, well, this is no specific culture. This is just fictional. It's like, really, do you know what this is right here? Yeah. Easter Island, those don't exist anywhere else in the world. That's a tapui. It's on Easter Island. You don't see that anywhere else. It's not a generic Polynesian thing. It's not a generic native thing. You know, but it also speaks to the look at them, the bone in the hair, the, the skin color, the grass skirt. It kind of, again, kind of goes back to that sort of dark continent notion, you know, imagery that we saw in the early 20th century and 19th century. Um, and it does not resonate well here in the 21st century. And so you can understand why some groups are feeling, why are you picking on us? What did, what did we do to you? I mean, hey, you know, um, so you guys come down to Tahiti and Hawaii and everything and enjoy our sun, and then you make a stupid game. So um, anyway, so yeah, that's one of those things where it's not convincing that the developers said it's not a specific culture because they, they pegged it. So... So then intercultural dissonance. So when we have tension between different cultures for all kinds of reasons, could be historical, could be religious. I mean, it's just kind of a, a general sense of, of stuff going on. So here's, here I am picking on Age of Empires again. Um, so this, when this game was released um, in Korea in 1999, can anyone tell me why retailers were reticent to put it on the shelf? Ex Exactly, because of the, the samurai, because of the Japanese samurai. Because a lot of people know that there has been a lot of tension between Japan and Korea over the centuries. Just like that's part of a dynamic in that region between China, Korea, and Japan. It's a very competitive, uh, competitive culturally, not just economically. Um, and so this basically was upsetting. The other reason why it was so... Um, problematic at that time period, 1999, is because it relates to a geopolitical incident that, that was going on. So in the middle of the Sea of Japan, there's a little rock, literally, well, it's not little, it's, but it's probably as big as this building. Um, it's called Dokdo in Korean, Takashima in Japanese, and that rock has been disputed between the two countries for a long time now, and in 1999 was one of those periods where they had an escalation of tension over it, and they were really at each other's throats. I mean, close to going to conflict, military conflict over it, um, and it remains disputed to this day, but this is one of those heightened periods, and so this game became essentially collateral damage to that cultural friction going on at the time, and that made it difficult for the game to sit on the shelf just because of that issue, and so when they did the expansion pack, you can see how most of the world saw the one on top with Montezuma in the middle, and then Korea got the one on the bottom with a Korean general front and center, so in a way, it was kind of a way to make up for the cover in the first place over there. So um, 
So yeah, so this kind of thing, again, playing into not only the cultural tension that might exist there, but playing into it what's going on right now in that market or around the time of release. It's very important. Um, then we have stuff like this. Obviously, these are all fringe indie games that got developed. But again, these are the kind of things the, the unintended people will see. And this is what they peg in their mind is what video games are all about. Stuff like this. This game that was created by the Hezbollah to train youth on how to kill Israelis. Um, this one by the white supremacists. This one by, you know, others. Um, so, yeah. Use of stereotypes, you know, hate speech, all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, and I know a lot of people say, well, these aren't real games. It's like, But they're games and they're out there. And again, it's a perceptual issue. You know, the, the unintended people are seeing this kind of stuff. And in their minds, a lot of them are equating this on the same level as something like Halo or whatever else is out there. Because they don't know the difference. You know, they, have, they really don't know. Exactly. They don't. They don't have the background. They don't know casual versus console and all that kind of stuff. So then this category, geopolitical imagination. So basically when a country likes to reinforce its national sovereignty, it's like, what the hell is this doing in a game? It's like, but it's still, this is one of those things that governments really get upset about. And so in Hearts of Iron, which was banned in China, both versions was banned. Because you can see here, I don't know if you've played Hearts of Iron, but er well, most people have played the board game Risk. And so it's very much like Risk. The world is divided up into more or less arbitrary sections. You can see here China, and China is divided up into many different regions here. And, um, but what China was, ups the government was upset about, the fact that Tibet and Taiwan were not shown wholly a part of China. The real ridiculous part of this is that this game takes place in World War II. People, People's Republic of China did not exist yet. And so the Chinese government at these days has a habit of basically reinforcing their sovereignty in perpetuity into the past. So they want to see Taiwan and Tibet shown as Chinese territory, even when it doesn't even make sense. So it kind of, again, sort of ties back to that Age of Empires example earlier with Korea and Japan with the Chozon Empire and everything, where it's just kind of like, this doesn't make any sense, but... It doesn't, that's, we're not dealing with sense here. We're dealing with perception of the government. Um, again, like with another one, this was a major issue because what's happening here, you're using the flag of Taiwan, which is forbidden in China. You're using the term Republic of China, ROC, again, forbidden in China. These are both instant bans in, the ch in China. Um, you're also calling the Republic of China a country. So you're, I mean, this is just like a triple strike. I mean, you're in so much trouble. So. No. They didn't. They didn't know. I'm serious. So, so basically, my solution, or were you asking a question? You mean like this? <laughs> so yeah, so so this is a very easy solution. So <laughs> Right. Well see, the the point is when you get to sensitive things like this, the 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 real strength, when you need to have people choose, put the decision, make the onus on the user, not on you. You're not deciding what's a country. They are. You can put Taiwan on a list and call it country region. What is it? I don't know. It's a country if I'm from Taiwan, if I happen to lean that way politically in Taiwan. Some people don't. So um, let them decide. Even more generic is just say locale. But the reason we don't use locale sometimes is because when it comes to translation, locale is a little bit more difficult to translate across different languages than country and region. That's why. Um, like in German, the word land, it, which means country, uh, it's, it's not easy to differentiate that in German. Um, so this is a very simple fix right there. You take the flag out. Why did you need the flag? It's redundant. You've got the country name or region name. You don't need the flag. You know, it's just it's it's a redundant piece of information. It looks pretty. I love flags, but sometimes you don't need them. Yeah. 
Yes, absolutely, which was my point earlier. This is why I was stressing that point early on, kind of doing my Johnny Appleseed thing, was that global ubiquity, global exposure, when these kinds of issues come up, I can tell you the truth from my own experience, the Chinese government does not care how it got in their borders. They don't care if it was black market, they don't care if it came through Hong Kong for 50 cents or whatever. The fact that they see it, they, they will react to it. You know? Now they may not have much ground to stand on because you, know, like you may not have a subsidiary office there, or you're just kind of like off in some far country. But I also know from past experience that if you do have a subsidiary office there, you might expect a visit from the state police, and you might see like the head of the office go away for a day or two to be questioned. So, and that has happened. Um, so I worked on another issue that involved a non-game product in which the, the head of the office of the subsidiary was put in jail because of a map-related issue. And they basically said, fix the map or they stay in jail. And um, you don't want to stay in a Turkish prison, which is where they were. So, um, so these can get very, very serious issues. They, they, I mean, yeah, so these two products, again, it sounds like I'm picking on Korea a lot tonight. I'm really not trying to, but they have great examples because one of the things I love about Korea, and I really do love Korea, but one of the things I love is they are passionate about their culture and the government agencies, like the Ministry of Information, the Game Rating Board, all of these entities, they're one of the few entities in operation around the world compared to like Peggy and Ciro and all these others where they are actually looking at political and cultural issues when they do a game review, not just you know, violence, profanity, sexuality, all that kind of stuff. So with these games, the, both of these games were banned in South Korea because they showed North Korea as an antagonist. Because there's a long-term goal for the two Koreas to unite. If you see maps on the wall in South Korea, usually it shows the entire peninsula as the country. It does not show just South Korea. Right. Okay, thank you. I'll get a new cover. Okay, I pulled the wrong cover, but thank you, I'll change it. So. But yeah, so Ghost Recon, a version of Ghost Recon, and mercenaries were banned um, because of that one reason, because North Korea was the villain, so to speak. But what's very interesting, in 2007, a lot of Korean gamers basically voiced a free speech issue over this, and the Korean government overturned their decision. So you can play these games in Korea now, because gamers are saying, look, you know, it's just, it's a free speech issue, just let us play it, you know? And, the other thing that plays along with that, again, is with kind of the current state of affairs, because back during that time, like back in the early OOs, um, there was more kind of a, um, a feeling of, of uh, unity between the North and South, but nowadays there absolutely isn't because of some of the naval incidents recently. And so now I think South Korea is like, yeah, show them as a villain. We don't care. So... Um, so, okay, so looking at culturalization in the development cycle. So a simplified version here, just concept, core production, release phase. So what we typically have in the early phase is, you know, the concept, the backstory, the, the character and environment design, all the kind of the fundamental stuff that creates the world, the basic assets that are creating the world. Culturalization, this is where it happens this is where it really should happen, is at the very beginning. Because in my experience, at least 75% of all potential issues can be caught right here. So like when I work on a project, I'm sitting down with the artists, the writers, the producers, right at the beginning and talking with them. What are your, what, what's the game about? What's the backstory? What do the characters look like? What, you know, what, all of that kind of stuff. Going through all of the artwork, looking at the symbols they're creating for like the different clans or whatever it might be. Um, looking at different words and vocabulary and the glossary behind the game, looking at character names, just kind of getting an overall sense of what is this culture and the world that they are creating, you know, and s just kind of getting a feel for it. And that's where I can do very minor course correction at the very beginning, you know, and not just me, but I mean anyone who do does this kind of work. So that when you get into this phase, we are actually creating the bulk of the content. 
it's a lot easier because you've kind of weeded out all those areas where it could go astray, although there are some issues here that we'll talk about in a minute. And then by the release phase, basically, there's not much else to do. You know, anything that may have been found, you just kind of check it off and say, okay, it's fixed, this is fixed, this is fixed. Um, and more often than not, that kind of checking process where you're, it's more iterative, it goes on like kind of in a spiral throughout this entire development process. It's not kind of it all happens at the beginning because as content gets created, it basically needs to be checked and approved and, and all that. And it's something that is, is often done right alongside all the content creation. It's not something where everything has to stop. Let, let the person review it and then we'll get a check off. It's just, you know, something that keeps continuing. You know, so that's culturalization really must start and happen at the beginning. It's so essential because a lot of the examples I showed you, like go back to the Brahmin example, that's something that was caught like over here at this stage. There's not much you can do about it. That's a timer. <laughs> um, anyway, so not my phone. Um, so yeah, so when it gets that late in the cycle, I mean, there's really not much you can do. And I know a lot of the examples I showed you were ones that happen very late. You know, they'll, they'll come and they'll say, what, what are we supposed to do? It's like, now you just do damage control. That's all you can do, unless you want to spend the money to fix. Otherwise, if you told me this like three months ago, a year ago, two years ago, done. It's easy to say, don't do it. So, so some keys. So I'm going to go through these. Um, uh, some of the kind of tips that involve culturalization, just so you have an idea of some of the things that you can do to try and um, avoid some of the problems I've mentioned. So contextual independence, um, observe contextual proximity, um, performing smart surgical decisions, which is super important, because a lot of times people, when, when you confront them and say, look, the culture you're creating in this game is an issue because of A, B, and C, um, but you're not trying to destroy the whole idea. You know, you don't want to throw the whole idea out. You're just trying to look for those few things that might be an issue, um, creating cultural evidence, and finally anticipating the expectations of the local market. So what is contextual independence? So basically, it's, it's usually shown better by example, which I have one. Um, so basically, if a content element, let's take a symbol, the more independent it is, the less it needs its original context so that you know the meaning, okay? So basically, it's a symbol that you would notice anywhere. It's something you don't need to know. It doesn't have to show up like in a certain environment or like on a certain costume or something like that. You will know it. Um, so like this, both of these are offensive, but which one is independent? Which one? Exactly, the swastika. Because we all know what this is. All of us know what this is. We don't need anything to tell us what this is, especially the fact that it's at a 45 degree angle in a white circle on a red background. We all know what that is. The one on the, the left is the Greek matzah, which is basically this. So in Greece, that's very offensive in parts kind of around the Mediterranean. So that's offensive in Greece, but it's not offensive in the United States. It's not offensive in a lot of other parts of Europe or the rest of the world. Whereas this, everyone's going to know what this is. Almost everyone. So because we have such this you know, historical ingrained notion to it. So when you see it showing up in content, you know, it's a matter of wh where is it appropriate. And so there was a time where Germany was banning every swastika, hands down, must not appear in a game. They've lightened a little bit on it, a little bit. It's got to make sure that the context is very, very appropriate. So basically history. So like in Medal of, um, Medal of Honor, you're infiltrating a German bunker. Well, you'd probably see a swastika there. I mean, that's what th was there during World War II. Um, whereas the interesting one with like the Pokemon card from Japan, where it's showing the left-facing manji, which is a symbol of Buddhism. And you see it all over temples, all over Asia. You even see the right-facing one, too, in a lot of places in Asia. But the Anti-Defamation League basically got the Pokemon company to remove this card because of the swastika, even though it's not the swastika that we know over here on the right. And so it's just the symbol has become so strong, culturally negative, that um, basically it just kind of evokes a reaction that um, people just like get rid of it. We don't want to see it. So um, 
it's, yeah, so it's, it's a sen sensitive symbol. And of course, you know, it's always a matter of perspective, too. So I don't know if you heard about this story a few years ago where um, in Google Earth, when they updated their imagery database, some people noticed this. Does anyone know about this? Yes, in San Diego. So, now, so this started having people bring up all these conspiracy theories that, wow, we really did have Nazis working in the government in World War II, you know, and oh my God, they left their mark on San Diego, and you know, it just like, it was just, you know, it was just a blueprint. I mean, so anyway, so yeah, it's, it, this, but the symbol, again, so powerful, it kind of generates that response. So contextual proximity, this is an easy idea. It's basically, if you're creating a piece of content, like an environment or a person or anything, if it's mimicking a real-world object, the more it mimics, the more it's sensitive, the more potentially sensitive it might be. And so it's just really simple. It's like if it's proximal to the original, the closer it is, the more sensitive it's going to be. So like when... Medal of Honor came out a couple years ago, and in the multiplayer mode, they decided to use the name Taliban as the force that you could actually play in multiplayer mode, not just fight against. That was extremely sensitive. You, I'm sure you probably heard this in the news. This is one of those ones where military bases banned the game. They said, we will not sell this game. Um, at first, EA was just like, oh, come on. You know, it's just get over it. We're being realistic. But again, short tale of history. This is going on right now. This, ki this conflict is still going on. And so do you really want people to go in and play as a Taliban you know, soldier or whatever? Um, you know, and I can understand both sides of the argument, I mean, easily. It's like, well, it is realistic. It's very realistic, but, you know, do, do they need to be Taliban? It's kind of like the Fallujah example. So they changed it to opposing force, which is like, well, by that time, it just didn't, you know, it didn't matter. Everyone knew that it was Taliban. But the, the kind of the footnote to this is that a lot of people thought the game kind of sucked anyway. So it really didn't... You know, which, which does play into how volatile these issues can become. If the, if the game becomes super popular and very widely known, it can escalate the sensitivity of the issue. So, um, so this is just one of those kind of no-brainer things. Why call it Taliban? Either just make something up and make sure what you made up is not sensitive somewhere or just, you know, do something else. Um, because at the end of the day, how much, how much does that affect gameplay if you don't use the name Taliban? Probably zero. Zero. Oh, I almost did that. That's a middle finger, too, in certain parts of the world. So um, I can just do those all day, you know? Um, anyway, uh, so performing surgical decisions. Again, I was stressing this early. So make the most minimal change to the least amount of content. That's really your goal. Um, you don't, because I've worked with the, alongside creative people for so long now, and the number one thing they will come back to me with is just like, you're destroying my creative vision. And it's just like, no, I'm trying to help you. I want your game to be enjoyed by as many people around the world as possible, because I love your game. It's an awesome game, but you've got one or two little things that if you just take those out or change them, you'll just remove any possibility of sensitivity anything. So do you want that or not? And it's like, well, but we're really wedded to this. And, you know, um, but that, that's one of those things. And we'll get to that in a minute. You know, there is a, there is a chance where a game developer can just say, we are not going to change it. Um, and then they can play with the consequences. So like, here's one that might want to change. So, um, <laughs> and this one kind of speaks for itself. So um, you release this in the United States, it's probably not going to go over well, especially when it's targeting younger people who are using this. Um, so this is, this, yeah. Exactly. E exactly, precisely. So, so this is a very easy fix, you know, they just did this and problem solved. No problem, no issues. Um, there was another one too, but f to, out of respect for the people who are hosting this theater, I'm not going to go into this one, um, but this was a, a heck of a one. Um, so here's a really important point too about um, during the process of game development is creating 
what's, what is sometimes called the cultural evidence. And I know Richard Garriott once used that term in a talk last year, and I thought it was a great way to describe it. So cultural evidence is essentially everything that the designers and game developers do to basically backfill the environment to make it feel real, whether it's the addition of plants and trees, the addition of, you know, um, you know, objects on the side of the street, banners and flags on the buildings, um, signs, all of that kind of stuff that where you backfill the world. Usually during this phase is where it's the highest risk activity, even if all the culturalization, the major culturalization issues were discussed early on in the cycle, but this is where the artists and the writers and everything are basically let loose, just fill the world, create what you need to create because we're on a deadline. And so when they go about doing this, this is where there's so much content being produced that a lot of people just don't check this stuff. And because there is such a tight time schedule usually, this is also where a lot of the um, developers and artists will start pulling in stereotypes because stereotypes are easy, you know, because they say, well, we need to convey something that's kind of Asian. Okay, make their hair black, make their eyes kind of, you know, narrower. Um, what else can we do? Oh, make a building that's sort of pagoda-ish. You know, I mean, start pulling in all these elements that try and evoke the feel of what they want to say, where it's, it's harder work. I mean, it is harder work to actually be creative and create something that doesn't exist because then you also have to build the rest of the evidence around it to make people know what it is. So um, there's also the notion of applying logical consistency along with this. So basically, you should only be putting in the game into the game's culture and world what really makes sense. You don't put things that don't make sense. So here's an example. So Cameo, Cameo takes place in a completely fictional universe, has nothing to do with all this. And so you can see here there's wooden crosses on the side of the road. What are those supposed to mean? You know, so the artist was asked, what are these? Um, and they're like, well, they're graves. Of course they're graves. It's like, well, what do you mean, of course? There's no Christianity in this universe, you know? So why would there be a cross in this cameo universe if there's no Christianity to, you know? And the response is, well, what were we supposed to use for graves? And it's like, you're the creative artist. It's like, come up with something. And, you know, by the way, there are other forms of grave markers around the world that are very diverse from this. So... Um, that's one of those things where you could say, well, they were being lazy or whatever they were being. That's one of those things where it's very incongruent. This world, that object has no place in that world. Um, it may have a place in other worlds if you're doing like something, you know, like an Assassin's Creed and real history and all that, um, but not in this case. So um, it just doesn't make any sense. So, so then anticipating local expectations. So as we know, gamers these days are communities. It's not just single individuals who buy a DVD and they sit in their house and they never talk to anyone. Maybe that is true, but um, no, but they are, they're socially networked. They talk to each other. They, you know, they rally, rally each other. Um, and we, we've seen this. I mean, the, the power of community, the Arab Spring that happened was the result of online community. You know, it didn't just change, you know, it changed society in certain countries. It changed the entire structure of the country and the, and the culture and the politics of the country. And so there's that kind of fervency that goes along with it. And so, um, so this is, again, assuming instant global exposure. So you are exposing your content to everyone and what that entails, whether they are going to instantly support it if they love it, or they will instantly vilify it and backlash and work actually actively work against you. Has anyone heard of Mass Effect 3? What happened with Mass Effect 3? And um, we can talk and debate about whether or not Bioware's actions are what you would do as a creative entity, but um, the most important thing to remember about stuff like this when you're dealing with the community is that from their perception, you're always guilty. Always. So if you're dealing with a cultural issue where you offended them or you did something that might be problematic for their market, they always assume you did it on purpose. Always. In all the years I've been doing this work, I've never heard someone say, oh, it's okay, we forgive you. No, it's just like, why did you do this? What did we do to you? What, what, what do you have against our culture? Oh, why, we knew the United States was like this. We knew, you know, on and on it goes, you know. So um, that's, it's a very important point to remember. So 
this is a good quote to remember along with this stuff. So, because um, this is from someone who would know. So, um, you know, the freedom of speech issue and uh, freedom of expression. And so I'm very strong on this point. I mean, a lot of people, I've been called all kinds of names, not always positive in the course of doing this kind of work, because I'm usually the person they don't want to see come in the room and, and you know, like tell them you need to do this and not do that and blah, blah, blah. You know, but a lot of them, they just don't understand. I'm a, I love games. I'm a gamer, and I love what they're doing, but I'm also I'm trying to help them, and so sometimes I have to use a stick. But... Um, I want them to exercise the creative vision, but they really must remember that they can't expect local cultures to adopt their level of, of creative freedom. Because a lot of game developers will like say, well, it's a freedom of speech issue. It's like, well, yeah, here in the United States and in some other countries, but in a lot of other countries in the world, that notion does not even exist at all. There is no freedom of speech. There is no, you know, uh, it just doesn't happen. And so, so that they often will say stuff like, well, what are we supposed to do then? Just change our game or not do it? And Like, you can do anything you want at all. You are a free person. You can do anything. You can create any game you want. The main thing is that if you do that and you know that you might have content that might be a problem, you have to be prepared to defend your choices. So I bring this up because it's very important. I've seen too many game developers over the years where they will essentially, you know, they have a problem like a government or a gaming group or something will come back and say, you know, we don't like that. It's really pissing us off. And they're like, well, we thought it was cool. That's the response. I've, I've heard that literally many times. We thought it was cool. That doesn't go anywhere, you know, especially with a the government. They're just like, cool. What did they, what did they mean? I'm not, you know, I mean, basically what I have seen work is that when a game developer, they know for a fact that something they put in their game might be problematic, might be a little bit edgy. And so what did they do? They basically wrote up a very brief explanation of why it's in the game. Now, this is something they just kind of keep on a shelf. They don't need to post it on, you know, or blog it about it. This is something that you have in reserve in case you are asked about the issue you know, in case it comes up, so you can basically say, look, we did our research, we talked to this expert or this academic, we read, looked at these sources, and basically we made a decision that we thought it would be a good idea for the game that we are creating, and we're sorry you don't like it. I've actually seen governments kind of take a step back and say, I think they know what they're doing, what are we supposed to do now? You know, they, they basically say, okay, maybe we can actually talk with you because you're, you seem like you thought this through, so let us you know, discuss this with you and basically s make you understand. That doesn't mean they're going to change their mind. They, they'll still probably ban the product if you don't fix it. But you can at least have that dialogue, you know. And then, then you can go blog about it to everyone in your gaming community and say, look, the government told us to fix it. We're not going to do it because we have our reasons right here. And, you know, we, we're taking the high road and they're just being mean. So, um, or whatever. So, um, so yeah, so that, that's a very important thing. I, I think it's very important that, that people m remain creative and don't be afraid to, to create stuff because I've, I've seen people, as a result of talking to me too much, is they get really paranoid, you know? So it's like they draw like a little symbol. Is this okay? Yeah, it's fine. She's like, is that all right? It's like, yeah, it's, it's, don't worry about it. It's fine. But, hey, if you want to keep paying me to do that, I, I can do that. But... Um, but yeah, I mean, you don't want to be too paranoid, but you do just want to be thoughtful about it. You just want to think about that kind of stuff. So there you go. So you have any questions for me?